So, welcome back to Get A Brew YouTube channel. Today I wanna to do things a little bit differently. So Dylan, who's behind the camera, um, hasn't been getting the buy-in from the folks at home about um, his beers. Let's just say he's been making some questionable beers. We all learn from experiences and we all have to go through that process before we get there. Um, some of my team have made beers for the first time, gave them to me to try recently, and I thought, wow, if my first beer tasted that good, I'd be incredibly impressed. But um, going back to basics, there's nowhere to hide behind when you brew a lager or German Pilsen style beer. And um, to try and get Dylan's folks and his wife and friends, he wants to get them to buy into it. So we're gonna create a recipe today that he can take home and make and hopefully impress friends and family. We're gonna take a walk around the warehouse, get the recipe put together, hand over the ingredients to Dylan, who's on the other side of the camera, and then he's gonna take it home, brew it, let you see the brew day, and let the liquid do the talking. All being well, so let's go. Dylan is wanting to take, get a recipe that he can get his friends and family to buy into. I've suggested a lager Pilsner style beer. My thought was one of the crisp Pilsner recipes, maybe with a few tweaks, depending on what you think. So the recipe in this particular one is 3.98 kgs of German Pilsen, 120 grams of Vienna malt. So that's really high in percentages. It's probably like 97% Pilsen, 3% Vienna. Perfect lager yeast for this, a diamond lager yeast. And then we're gonna go for a mixture of hops, Magnum, Hirschbrook, and Tetanang. Tetanang we're gonna add when we chill the, chill the wort down at 80 degrees. The reason the wort's being chilled down before you add the Tetanang is to allow those noble hops to really shine through at that temperature. Noble hops is um, probably a terminology used for traditional hops for this style. So it's a traditional noble European hop. Again, the yeast, lots of options. Um, we've got Y yeast, um, pills and liquid yeast smack packs. We've got White Labs options there and liquid yeast. Also, there's Fermentus. We just prefer Lalamond and it's a really premium pack this. So what the guys do in the warehouse here whenever they're creating a recipe is obviously they, they can work off the folder or they can go to the computer, print off the recipe kit. So the recipe kit has the ingredients listed out here. So what Chris has done is he's picked up the yeast out of the fridge, protoflock tablet. That'll all be packaged into its own individual packaging. And now he's just writing up on the little resealable hot packs there. But um, the grammage, the variety, that it's a hot tea bag and when it's to be added. And then that means that you can simply refer to the hot packets when they add them in comparison to the sheet and then they'll be vacuum packed and sealed. So we'll come out of the hop fridge into the malt area. You can hear that that's actually my dad on the fork truck. He loves to do this when we're videoing. As soon as the camera switched on, he's something to move. <laughs> Chris has crushed the sack of German pills and malt, so we crush everything here, super fresh. You do grist analysis on it, making sure that it's crushed correctly, so you get the correct extract and the correct runoff. Guys crush full sacks, put them into the, the white tubs, which allows them to pick and pack a lot quicker. Given the volume of stuff that we move here, um, this works really effectively for us, so. So, there we go. It's an all grain recipe kit packed specifically for Dylan. We've done all we can. It's now over to you, Dylan, to do your worst. <laughs> so, how's it going? My name's Dylan, and I work with the dudes at Get A, Get a Brew. As Johnny mentioned, I have brewed some questionable beers at the time. I've been home brewing for a good long enough that I should be not brewing questionable beers. And a lot of that has been down to a few things, all right? It's not understanding and controlling fermentation temperatures. It has been bad sanitization. Sanitization? Sanitizing? Bad sanitizing, all right? Well, not sanitizing correctly. And 
the wrong equipment. I'll get into a bit of that as we go, but today we're brewing this, which is a um, German Pilsner. Instructions, hops and yeast, a few stickers, and malt. So, a German Pilsen malt. I've been given the, instru the instructions, which you should absolutely follow to a T. Don't change things because you think you should. And in saying that, I'm looking here, it's telling me there's a mash liquor volume of 15 liters, but I've decided I'm just gonna mash in at 20. <laughs> because I looked at 15 and I was like, that can't be the right amount. That's a lot of grain to chuck into 15 liters of water. It's gonna, like, it's gonna be like porridge. So we're gonna mash in a 20. We're gonna be doing everything else correctly as is. So when I started brewing, I started, my, it was my brother and I, we started on like a pot. It's in here somewhere, right? Like a pot on a hob, horrible. And then we moved to an induction cooker, like it'd be plugged in outdoors. Um, I did extract brewing at the beginning. Right, extract brewing was fine. And that was pretty much successful the entire way, apart from the first couple where we didn't sanitize stuff correctly. But then we moved to brew in the bag before going to all grain brewing. But it is a really fun process and it is quite interesting as long as you note down what you're, what, what you're doing the whole time. You know, we write down everything we've done each brew so you can look back and go, that's where we messed it up. <laughs> that bit, where we ignored what we should. Anyway, because sometimes you get the instructions and then you change the leaders for the mash in, so who knows. now. Regarding gear, one of the big things that I changed was this thing here. It's the Beacon Brewster all-in-one system. When you start, you see things like the Grainfather, but they're super pricey. These things are a little bit more reasonable in price, but I'll tell you what, this made such a difference to the brew, it's, it's crazy because you can control your mash temperature, you can control your brew temperature the whole time. Whereas before, I was sitting there with a thermometer. This has made it really much easier. This filled up to 20 liters, it's up at mash temperature, so we're gonna add the grain first we're gonna mash in. It's kind of clever, you go in, you set it manually, and you set your temperature point that you want, and then it'll push up, well it should do when you say start. So that'll be the heating element on, and then it'll push it up to 63, and once it hits 63, in a couple of minutes, that's when we'll mash the grain in. First time I've been able to use this new mash paddle. We're filming in the breweries all the time and the guys are always like mashing it with the cool wooden paddles. And then Johnny was like, do you know we sell those? And I was like, no I did not, but now I need one. So it's my mini paddle. Makes it feel more legit. So that mash is gonna sit there at 60, around 63 degrees for about an hour. At this point, you can kick back, do something else, keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't, who, who knows what it's gonna do, all right? If you're new to this sort of stuff, the, the next thing to remember is sanitizing, right? Keeping everything clean. So what I do is, like what most people do, spray bottle with sanitizing fluid. I use Chemi Pro. Um, it's pretty easy. If, you, if you've never used this bottle before, it's just so you know this, because it took me ages to work out, there's a little funnel here and you need to fill it up and there's measurements on the side. Squeeze it, fills up. If you know that, you're laughing at me, but if, you, if you've ever tried to do that, and you wondered what the Bojangles was going on. That's how that bottle worked. That's the spray bottle. Um, the other thing you need is like another bucket. This is like a, a cheap bucket when we started using it. I just use it literally for sanitizing fluid, right? And everything's in here from like trial jars to hydrometers to scissors, bungs and, and bits and pieces. And I always keep a, you know, a cloth in here as well. Once we've gone through the hot element of this, it's just about sanitization. Sanitizing. Ah, what is that word? Keeping everything clean, right? In the bag, from get a brood, we got three hops, we got yeast, and we got a protoflock tablet, I think. Is that right? All right, so this is quite, a, this is the first time I've brewed uh, a pills. Now we're using, uh, what are we using here? Magnum, Hurstbrucker, and Tetnanger, which I'm excited about. Just purely because I've been to Tetnanger and actually had beer from a clay jug from one of the bars a long time ago. It's irrelevant to this. And then lager yeast. This seems like a good time to actually drink a beer as well. Why not, you know? We're brewing a lager, we're drinking a lager. A beer from Mescan Brewing. They're in Westport in Ireland. All Belgian style beers. Let's crack that open. You 
can never just drink a beer. You gotta swish it. You gotta snip it. You gotta all do, do all that. Don't act like you don't do it. I tell you what, 4.9%. You can smash quite a few of those. 40 minutes left of the mash and it will crack on. Real quick rundown from my setup so you can see what I use here. This is my garage. It's kind of a, sometimes there's bicycles, sometimes there's fitness, sometimes there's beer. All right, so Beacon Brewster. I think it's a Beacon Brewster 40 for mashing in and for boiling. I used to mash into one of those like Gatorade coolers. It didn't really work that well. Bottles are all in these boxes behind me. Um, and then I have two, well, three fermentation vessels. I've got one of the basic white buckets that's down there. I've got a Firmzilla, which is great. It's a flat bottom. It is very good though. Big access point at the top, nice big screw lids. I would use that and the white bucket for brewing wine as well. And they work amazingly for that. And then I've just got this, which is a Firmzilla pressurized fermenter. I use the fermenters in this thing here, the Ferminator. This is a game changer because I could never ever keep um, my temperature correct or consistent in the first, well, could, ever. So the first few days I always like, I lost loads of stuff because of that. But this thing has got like a motor in the back that you program, you pop it open. The vessel, the fermentation vessel goes in. This is an extender piece, they, they're normally smaller. And then this fan regulates the temperature for you. So you pop it in and you just leave it. And it'll sit at 21 degrees perfectly. But this thing is just made of polystyrene. Um, it's light, it's, it works, an absolute treat. The reason why I'm brewing a, a, like a German Pilsner is I used to go to Germany a lot and I love German beer. But every time I brew IPAs or stouts or whatever, I always try wacky things. The last one I tried was a New England IPA. <laughs> When I first brewed it and drank it, it was delicious. It was a lovely, like, yellowy gold color. I learned afterwards that you shouldn't really bottle condition a New England IPA, apparently. I, I did. Second of all, way too much sugar. What do you see? That's actually not that bad. Actually, it doesn't look too bad, to be honest. So you can see the head on that. Like, honest, like, way too much sugar. <laughs> hey, guys, there's your beer. I'll just go get your flake. Ridiculous. But, head aside, I'm not sure what you can see of that. It's actually not a bad looking beer, to be honest. It's, like, it's fizzing like an absolute maniac. Um, probably the tastiest beer that I've made to date, but it was only really delicious for like two weeks, and then everything since then has been, well, it's been a bit sketchy. I can drink it from a R&D perspective, going, oh, that's good, I think I could change this the next time. But the problem is I keep giving this like to my wife. She sees the amount of time that goes into making the beer and then she drinks it and goes, don't like it. If we try a lager, she drinks lager, she likes lager, so let's try that. But let's do a German pills so that I get a beer that I quite like. So that's why we're brewing a German lager to get the buy-in from my wife and extended family and friends who also go, I got. Wow, still. You can go in the pool in a minute, let me just do some. Basically, that's, that's how easy it is to remove the, the grain from there. This is just warped, and then that all goes in a green bin. Um, so there's all you spend grains. While that is boiling there, we've got a few hop additions to add into this. So we stuck some Chuck some Magnum in at the boil. Excited by this one though, Tetnanger. Went to this pub in Tetnanger years ago, like a little um, like, like a little local town pub, and a tiny little restaurant you had to book in. Um, used to go there every year to these like bike events, and when you got out there, then they'd bring you these mugs. Oh my goodness, like mugs of beer, vice beer and pills and stuff like that. But it was all brewed in the in the region of Tetnanger. Tetnang? 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 Like very powerful beer. You know, you'd have like, sort of on you drink a lot of pints because you'd be with you'd be with a bunch of friends. And then the next day you'd be like, what on earth? What is, what happened to my brain? Generally I'll keep the lid off that bit for the boil. That's how you, because obviously you've, you've put a lot of water in for the boil. So you're going to lose a lot through the steam. Okay, so if you to like, just before the boil ends, we're going to drop the uh, chiller in. 
And then with a flame out, we're gonna add the last bag of hops. Hers are going in. It's like five grams of that. I, I just throw them in. You can mix them in a bowl, like in a cup thing, a little bit of water, swish it about and then pour it all in, but I'd rather just do that. I tried a lot of different um, chillers. This one is really good. These little bends at the top, I mean you can just hang it off the side of the, the vessel and connect a hose straight in and a hose line straight up directly from the tap. I don't have to move this because moving this thing is very dangerous. Yeah, that's at 82 now. Okay. Let that stand for 15 minutes and we're gonna run the water through the chiller and cool this all down. This pressure fermenter has two of these hose lock connections and there's a ball in the middle of it. You can see there like it floats. So the benefits to using one of these systems, you ferment in the container and it pressurizes it so that when it's finished fermenting in like a, in like a week, you can go straight to bottle and cap. You don't have to add priming sugar because that's what you're doing under pressure. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, okay, so what I'm doing here is using the pump built into the kettle to pump the wort out into the, the fermenter. Sterilize my hands, I sterilize you know, this container has been sterilized. This is a much easier way of doing it. Otherwise, what you're doing is um, transferring with pipes. Like before I was doing stuff like manually siphoning, <laughs> like siphoning from the thing, spraying it, then siphoning in. You can start to see where all these problems start to happen. So the pump that's built into the Brewster is pretty useful, not only for circulating the wort while you're chilling, which helps cool it quicker, but also for stuff like this. We're going to pitch Lalamond lager yeast. Need this to be under 15 degrees. They say like maximum 15 degrees. We'll do that and then that's it. It's not gonna be dry hopped. It's a lager, should be simple enough. Simple sprinkle. All right, we'll add the little floaty ball thing back in. Now at this point, some people would shake this up. I'm not gonna do that, I'm just gonna leave it. I wanna add a lot of pressure gauge onto this side here. This is the beer outlet. So this is your pressure gauge. This is gonna read how much pressure is being built up in it. It says you need to keep it at around 15 PSI. If you it's a lager, so you need to leave that to build up pressure. Um, come back, keep an eye on that and just check it and that should be. That should be great, so we'll leave that for five days and then we'll... Oh, I'm gonna transfer this first. That's why right. I have to move it from here to this. Yeah. Okay, so, to be honest, but look, we're here, we are where we are. That's gonna ferment. So that's it all sealed in place for now. So that'll keep it at 14 degrees fermenting at that consistent temperature the whole time. Uh, we'll come back to this in about five days. I'll keep an eye on the pressure, let that build up to 15 PSI. If you go too high, the whole thing's gonna explode. So, you're gonna be, that could happen. In which case, I'll see you when that happens. I just need to do a gravity reading. OG should be what? Um, original gravity of that is actually a bit higher. So, effectively, I had a more efficient mash than was expected. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of sugar come out of that. Original gravity, 105.0. That's quite an efficient mash, which is probably the first time that's ever happened. So, lager update. So, slight mess up on my side. All right. So I transferred into the pressured fermenter, and it was, it was all great, except I didn't check something. And uh, one of these little things just wasn't tightened correctly, and it was my fault let the pressure out. So what I had to do was resort to just a regular fermentation. So, so I didn't get to test the pressure fermentation this time. I will do it again. What I like to do is do silly stuff to make the whole process more difficult. It's like, ah, oh, the pressure must be in that. Maybe I'm having a problem with the pressure gauge or something. So I cracked on, I'm just gonna sort of play it by ear. Primary fermentation was about 10, 10 days. Transferred from primary into secondary. Um, so I could dump the trub out of the bottom of that thing. Crash cooled it. <laughs> but then realized that I crash cooled it and that's basically stopped the yeast from doing its thing. Um, then I added this here, this is CBC1 from Lalamond. It's a cask and bottle conditioning yeast. So I made a yeast starter kit, a little bit of that and some brewing sugar, transferred it into the secondary and left it for a bit to settle. Then I transferred everything into bottles. So instead of 
teaspoons into each bottle and just did it all in there with the yeast starter. <laughs> so that works. Assuming that I've done the sugars correctly, we should have a delicious lager in a, in a few weeks. So that'll need to just store now and condition in the bottles for about two to three weeks. Um, it does take a long time. The whole point of doing the pressure fermentation was that we could do the lager in seven to ten days instead of the three months that it takes to make a lager. Meanwhile, doing a uh, IPA today. Got a West Coast IPA, Simcoe, Columbus. Um, smells incredible. Just about to cool it, wash that fermenter out, and then start a new beer. I'll get that done, and I'll catch you after the fade for a test of the beer. Okay, so, so far, so good. You know, famous, famous last words and that. We're a week into the bottle conditioning, so I thought we could try one now. But ain't nobody got time to wait for three weeks for this video to finish. So let's pour this. If you, if you brew your own beer, you'll be like me, super anxious to try it. I always try it too early. If you're bottle conditioning, you are gonna get loads of sediment at the bottom as well. So that's kind of one of the other reasons I'd like to try pressured fermentation next time round. But hey, let's give it a shot one weekend, see how it's turned out. Sounds good. Fizz, which there should be. Color looks good. Here, that looks legitimate. Still needs time to carbonate a little bit more. That's a legitimate looking beer. That smells like an actual lager. Like if you went somewhere and got a lager and they brought it out and you went, that's a real beer. And I'm, the, I'm horrendous with smells and, and, and tastes, but that's got all the notes you would expect from a lager. Damn. Wow. That, I'm super impressed with that. Lacking a little bit of mouthfeel. Like, it's almost, it's a, I'd say, it's a little bit on the flat side, but like only the smallest bit. And if I ordered that in a pub, I'd be more than happy. I mean, here. There you go. I was, I'll be honest with you, I was a bit, I was a bit skeptical. <laughs> as I am with all my beers. But that is, that's the best beer I've made ever. That's the, that tastes like an actual beer. Just goes to show you, even a cowboy can make, can make a decent beer. With the right gear and the right ingredients. And a lot of phone assistance from Johnny at uh, Get A Brood. So quickly with the pressured fermenter, what I had done wrong, um, on the pressured conical fermenter thing, these little caps, there was a seal that I hadn't done correctly. One of these wasn't tightened enough and was like letting out a little bit of, a little bit of air. So you gotta make sure when you do that, they're tight, that the seals inside are, are correct, that you've maybe put a little bit of like PTFE on it and all this stuff is tight. I know that because Johnny and I then tried to do a pressured lager correctly at his place and it's worked. <laughs> So, user error, massive user error. I phoned Johnny up and I was like, right, pressure has dropped on this. <laughs> but I've transferred it to secondary and crash cooled it. And he's like, why did you crash cool it? And I was like, I don't know. I remember him telling me it was gonna need to be crash cooled. So I just went ahead and did that. But he was like, right, your problem with that is now that your yeast is not gonna be as active as you need when you bottle condition. So he told me to get the bottle priming yeast and do that. So we mixed that, that yeast story kit added that in, which is why we've got maybe a little bit more, you know, like, um, <laughs> dirt. <laughs> what do you call it? What's the name for that? A little bit more sediment in the bottle than we'd maybe like, but it fixed the problem. And that's the beauty of that. Even when you do make those small mistakes, speak to somebody that knows what they're doing and you can fix the, the issue and correct the beer and end up with something you could quite easily drink. And it's 11 o'clock in the morning right now. We'll drink the whole thing. We might as well be a waste not to try it. I'm really happy with the, the aromas. I'm really happy with the flavor. A little bit more fizz, but I'm assuming that's gonna come from the, the beer aging a little bit longer in the bottle. It's only been seven days since we bottled it. So maybe in two weeks time, it'll have a bit more fizz. If not, I know where I've gone wrong. And that's the bit that if I've learned anything, apart from sanitize and control your fermentation temperatures, if I've learned anything else in the last few years, it's write all the stuff down that you did so that you know the mistakes you made. So I can at least look back at that and go, Dylan, this is where you went wrong. This is what you need to fix the next time around. 
so you don't make the same mistake. So look, that's been great. I'm really happy with that. If you want to brew a lager at home the traditional way, you're going to have to be able, you're going to need something like this to, to control that fermentation temperature. And it's going to take like three months to do it. If you want to try brewing beer under pressure, we do have a, like, there is a video coming out all about that in the next week or two um, where Johnny gets it right. <laughs> So you can watch that. Watch that if you want to learn about brewing under pressure. It is possible as a home brewer to brew a lager that tastes pretty damn good. Any questions, don't ask me. Ask the guys at Get A Brewed. I've learned so much from working with Johnny and the team at Get A Brewed over the last year. I'll be honest with you, investment into gear has made a huge, huge change in what I've been doing. And I reckon I can get the missus to like, she'll like that. <laughs> she will like that. You know, and if she's gonna be happy with that beer, she's gonna be more enthusiastic about me brewing it. My parents are not gonna turn their nose up when I arrive around at their house with homebrew. Um, and generally, my mates will be able to actually appreciate what we're making here. So, thanks for watching this. It's been a long video. Hopefully, you've learned something or you've found it remotely interesting. If you wanna see more from the guys at Get A Brew, follow the, the channels below. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you aren't already. Hit the bell notifications and let you know when they upload new videos. So yeah, I'm super happy with um, how that's turned out. Uh, until next time, happy brewing. Cheers. God, let her taste that.